Hey everybody, Agrarian Libertarian here with you today. Uh, with me, I have my special guest, Matt. Go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm special. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Matt Erickson. I have been friends with Brett since 10th grade biology class, I think. At least and two. yeah, and um, one of the ways we bonded is uh, through our shared love of. I guess I'll start with. I'm a I'm a hospital chaplain. I I got my bachelor's in religion and political science at Northwestern College in Iowa, which is a good political state to go to during an election year. And um, I got my Master of Divinity in Evangelism and Discipleship at Talbot School of Theology, and now I'm a hospital chaplain, which is like a pastor who works in a hospital down in Newport Beach, California, and I'm back here in North Dakota, where I was uh, born and raised, and I'm here with my good friend Brett. And uh, one of the ways we bond it was over our shared love of politics and ranting about how messed up things are. And so now I get to be here and do this with you in front of everybody. So I'm very glad uh, that Brett has me here and, and uh, look forward to talking today. So, yeah, thank th you. Thanks for joining me, Matt. Yeah. So what kind of brought you into the libertarian fold? Uh, libertarianism for me was when I... Discovered it, I was a freshman in college, and I was a poli-sci major, and so I was taking this class called Political Ideologies, and we had to pick a, a policy issue, and, am I looking at the place? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> I had to pick a policy issue and give three different sides to it. Now, if, if you grew up in America, you're like, three different sides, that's impossible. There are only two different sides to every issue. There's a liberal side and a conservative side, and that's all there is. My issue was uh, school vouchers and, sco and school choice. And so I thought, okay, there's um, the, the conservative side, which says, yes, yeah, school vouchers are good. A lot of that focuses on um, especially um, private, religious, parochial schools, and then there's the the liberal, progressive, public school side says, no, vouchers are terrible, and they kill children, and all that stuff. And, um, but then I had to have a third policy issue, and so I, I thought, well, you've got the criticizing school vouchers from the left. Is there a way to, to go further to the right? And I found a place called the Cato Institute, which was talking even more fervently about school vouchers from an even more, like, free market perspective, not just about it's good to give people a chance to have a religious education and those kind of things. And um, through that, one of the books I had read as a, as a source was The Revolution of Manifesto by Ron Paul, and he was talking about education in there. But the, the biggest one, I, I, I realized, let me go back, the, the real moment where I became a libertarian was, I then the next semester I wrote a paper on taxation. My proposal was about the fair tax. I was arguing why we should have the fair tax, which is a, a national sales tax um, that replaces all other taxation. And um, so you, you, you need three sources. And so I did um, the progressive, like, no, we need taxation or else we'll all die. Uh, and then the pro fair tax side. But then I also dug out my old Ron Paul book and I saw what he had to say about taxation, which was well, we can cut all these taxes and not replace it with anything because we don't need to. We don't, we don't need because the fair tax is a revenue-neutral tax system. But we don't want a revenue-neutral tax system. You want the government to have less revenue so that you spend less money on things so that you shrink the government and make people's lives better. And at that point, I realized that, that the typical conservative way of uh, dealing with things didn't go far enough for me in terms of the scope of government, a lot of conservative people like government to be small in economic things, but they want to be in charge of uh, things like what kind of substances you put in your body or don't. Uh, they're also really big on, on war and those kind of things. And um, foreign policy is also an issue where I'm very much libertarian. I don't fit with the conservative um, way of thinking. So. Yeah, it's kind of the same here. I think the common theme between you and I is... is Really, it was Ron Paul that, that brought us into the fold, yeah. really. Like, he, he he had a message that just rang, you know, at least with the two of us and with so many other people that we might, we might know, too. And, and um, for me, uh, becoming a libertarian was just kind of the next logical step from being a conservative to, you know, okay, let's be a conservative. 
no, let's actually be a conservative. <laughs> right. You know, let's let's be actually fair and consistent in our in our beliefs. So for if that means, you know, getting the state out of uh, out of um, you know economic welfare and, and stuff mm-hmm. like that, that means we have to be consistent with that principle throughout. And right. uh, and uh, you know. Like, you know, you knew me, Matt, when I was younger, I was like, yeah, war, woo, let's yeah. do this. Well, now that, you know, cr- clearly my opinion has changed because, <laughs> the, you know, the f- facts and logic have dictated that, uh, yeah. you know, we've been, at, we, we've been at war in Afghanistan for longer than we were ever involved in World War One, World War Two, and it's Korea just, combined. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's, this, yeah, it's, ridiculous. It's, it's a war that drains resources. Afghanistan is a nation that kills empires. Why are we there? Yeah. The Soviet Union learned that lesson, and I think that we're smarter than... Russians so um, one of my favorite probably the biggest issue today that makes it impossible for me to say with pride like I'm a Republican is the immigration issue and I, I remember uh, on Brett's Facebook back in the day he had this quote from Ronald Reagan that said a nation without borders is not a nation and I, I think Brett has kind of moved a little bit more in terms of uh, and then like years later he had a quote uh, if people don't cross if goods don't cross boundaries then Army's so will and stuff. And so there has been that change. Uh, for me, immigration, I think that that's a big issue today. Uh, that it used to be, when I was comfortable being conservative, I interned with the North Dakota Republican Party during the 2010 midterm elections. And that was the Tea Party wave year. Um, that's actually where Just, Justin Amash came from, which is who I voted for for president uh, last time around. Um, but in 2010, the most conservative person was the person who would cut the most spending, cut the budget the most, and deal with debt the most. That's what a Tea Party conservative person uh, was. For me, um, but now, the most conservative person is who wants to admit the least immigrants. That's kind of what the most conservative person is. If you look at Republican primaries, uh, who wants to build the wall the most? That person is the most conservative person. It doesn't matter what they want. To, if they say, a lot of Republicans now say, we won't, we don't want to cut Social Security. We don't want to cut Medicare. You have to. <laughs> you have to cut those things if you want to deal with the debt at all. Um, and so, kind of the when that changed, when the issue about who is a conservative became some of these culturally conservative issues instead of economic, that's also where I especially changed. There's one thing. There's one thing to be said, though. Um, this is kind of probably this is probably the most where you and I might disagree, is the fact that you know I'm not saying I'm not I'm not shouting shouting from the rooftop you know build that wall, but what I am saying is that you know the United States needs to have a little bit of sovereignty. Yeah. And we we need these these immigrants need to be reminded that you know if if they want to be here, they have to be, adopting our mindset, our our American values. They they can't they they can keep their culture. And they can do whatever they want when they're here, um, as long as they're peaceful about doing it. But they they have to adopt the mindset that you know they're in a nation that's not theirs; it's another nation. Yeah. And so there, there's there's something to be said a little bit, at least a little bit about sovereignty. Yeah. That I I think that you need to have border security. You need to have a secure border. You need to vet people before they come in. You can't have like open borders. Um, at all um, and you need to be able to see who is coming in and out of the country and all those things but I definitely think that um, even looking at numbers we need to be admitting more immigrants and not fewer immigrants because um, number one if we weren't admitting immigrants our population would be shrinking because our birth rate is so low and uh, the only thing that's keeping our population growing at all is immigration and actually you look at, you hear, you if you listen to Donald Trump and some of these people, you'll think that there are just hordes and hordes and hordes of people from Mexico coming over, but um, more people last year actually left the United States to go to Mexico than actually came here. So um, it's easy to look at economic hardship and if you don't have a job and things like that and think and kind of blame somebody else for why you don't have a job, but in terms of immigrants, we actually have more people going to Mexico from America currently than coming into America from Mexico. So I think 
that building a wall especially would be solving a problem that doesn't exist. Um, that the, it's not like the the Spartans are at the gates, you know, and they're gonna take your jobs and and uh, yeah, that's what. I, Here, here's my my one probably the one big issue with the wall that I have is it's kind of a a, a matter of logistics, a matter of you know numbers and logical conclusions when it comes to the wall is that. The, the wall's not going to stop drugs coming into this country. It, there's there's no way because you have to realize that when you're dealing with a drug cartel from you know Mexico or even in the Central Americas, you're, you're dealing with people who either hire or have slave labor who are some of the best tunnel diggers in the world. Mm -hmm. What makes you think that, you know, they, they can build a tunnel 10 feet underground. What makes you think that they won't be able to tunnel under, underneath the, the wall? You know, what, what makes you think that they can't defeat any sort of um, underground, you know, defense system or whatever this wall might have or yeah. lack thereof? Who knows? Who knows what the wall's going to be made of? It's concrete and steel, I guess. But, um, and then the second thing is, okay, so say they can't dig under the, the, the wall. Well, how tall is the wall going to be? 50 feet tall? 100 feet tall? Either way, a low-flying aircraft that can fly under radar can clear the wall, drop a package off in the middle of the desert in Arizona, and fly back. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not that hard to beat a wall, guy, especially in today's world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the cost is definitely a, um, a major issue. I, I think, and if Trump and Republicans cared at all about the debt, um, they would say, well, if we pay for this $5 billion for... <laughs> For this wall, we have to cut five billion dollars from somewhere else. But they Here, here's here's an idea. But they haven't suggested that at all. Here's here's an idea. Why don't we cut all foreign aid? Because <laughs> yeah. if the walls if the walls apparently going to get built anyway, you may as well just take the dollars away from foreign aid, get them from countries that don't need it. We gave we gave China how however many billions of dollars in foreign aid last year. Why why do they need it? Right. They don't. Yeah. Uh, foreign aid. Uh, quote Ron Paul here. Foreign aid is taking money from poor people in rich countries and giving it to rich people in poor countries. That um, That's right. when you give foreign aid to somebody in Cambodia, if, if when America, nation to nation, when America sends foreign aid to Cambodia, the poor people who are starving in Cambodia don't see the money. The the um, regional power brokers and the the govern the bureaucrats in Cambodia they get the money and they add it to their plush apartments and things like that and people still starve and die and then America is poorer at the end of the day too so it doesn't help anything and then it's the question of is the wall even going to get built um, yeah. judging by how government works it's probably not even if you were to sign a bill to build the wall tomorrow in 2070 they'd still be like Today, we're laying the first stone of the wall, and it doesn't get built because the government doesn't do a very good job at a lot of things. <laughs> um, if you really want to build a wall, which, again, I don't think you should, um, there are some people <laughs> some people who actually started a GoFundMe. To, uh, did you see this? To, yep, I to, did. To pay for the wall. If you really want a wall, pay for it with your own money and donations, like, like, it's, an, like it's NPR, Pledge drive for the wall. Um, I don't like NPR either. I think that we should privatize the corporation for public broadcasting. But um, I mean, NPR is fine. I just don't want to pay for it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I like Garrison Keillor. Um, yeah. What other issues are on your mind today? Um. Not you know, let's. Right yes. Yeah, Where are we going? Look That's up. better. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um. Oh, speaking of well, talking about foreign aid, let's let's kind of get, travel down this little money hole here. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, as as libertarians, you know, we, we love you know we love capitalism. We love the idea that you know if you have a product that is at such and such a price and at such and such a quantity, if it's unattainable, that there's always going to be a substitution on the market. That 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 can apply to foreign aid because you know we could cut all foreign aid and. In its place, you know, why don't we have missions to these countries that actually go and benefit the poor? 
you know, I mean, how many Christian missionaries, you know, go to Guatemala every year? I, you know, I went there. That. Yeah. I went to Guatemala. I went to Ethiopia. Um, and there are other places I would like to go, too. Um, it's, it's real people helping real poor people in, the, you know, in these terribly impoverished countries. You know, and it, I, you know, I feel that, you know, you have people that, you know, are called by Christ to go out and help these people. Yeah. Let, let, them, let them do it. Yeah. Let them let them do it un, unhindered. Let them do it um, with the full, you know, grace of God and blessing from our government to go and, and help these poor people versus us handing a check to politicians in foreign countries. You know, yeah. it's and I, I really think that a lot of the secular governmental activist giving money to poor countries is not really to alleviate poverty. A lot of it is kind of this it's a t- uh, typical term now virtue signaling you want people to see that you want to help people and so you say I just gave money to this or, or did this or did that and I think that people are looking for purpose in their lives and so they try to find a cause to attach themselves to if you're secular if you don't have a rooting in in the gospel in Christ uh, life feels kind of unmoored and kind of kind of listless you know and uh, so you find this cause, I'm going to help refugees um, from Syria or things like that. Um, but wouldn't you rather have people who are loving other people because it's in their heart and they actually want to care for others because God called them to? In, in the Bible it says, you know, we love because God first loved us. And because God loved us, uh, my favorite pastor who I admire the most, uh, John Piper, says... Uh, the definition of love is the overflow of joy in God that meets the needs of others. So God loves you so much and you feel it so much that you just can't help but give it away to other people. And I would rather have people in poor countries being loved and helped by people who feel that kind of love for them than someone who's just saying, I don't know what to do with my summer vacation, so I'm going to go and build some houses in Haiti. You know, um, I, every house that gets built in Haiti is a good thing. It doesn't matter what your motivations are for doing it. I would just rather the charity come from a good place. Um, I'll branch off a little bit. Whenever uh, we talk about tax reform in this country, we talk about um, making sure we preserve these charitable exemptions and donations, that you get a a deduction from your taxes when you give to charity. Um, If you're giving to charity so that you can get a deduction on your taxes, you're not being charitable at all. I, uh, I wouldn't mind getting rid of those deductions because it would spur people to give out of actually the goodness of their hearts, not because Uncle Sam is going to take a little bit less from them when they're done at the end of the year. So um, to just check, uh, we're kind of getting on a tangent here, but to check why are you being charitable, why are you doing the good that you're doing? Is it for you or is it truly selfless um, the Bible says that love seek, seeks not its own. You don't love someone because of what you get in return. And I think that the real way to alleviate these problems in the world is through selflessly loving other people and not through starting a new government program to fix things. Um, and that's the real way to alleviate poverty, the real way to alleviate hunger and things like that is through individualistic private sector love. Um, I, I can go on about capitalism for a long time and if people ever ask me why do you love capitalism so much because I hate poverty so much capitalism is the biggest antidote to poverty we've ever had and there's a lot of talk out there that, that capitalism exacerbates pro- poverty that people are more poor be- because of capitalism um and you do see a bigger gap between rich people and poor people in capitalistic societies than you do in more egalitarian socialistic uh, societies. But, you know, Winston Churchill said, and there is no perfect system. There's no utopian form of government. But the one that tries to be utopian is socialism, which can't work. Uh, Winston Churchill said that the greatest failing of capitalism is the unequal sharing of its blessings. And the greatest failure of socialism is the equal sharing of miseries. And um, so you're going to have imperfect systems no matter what. 
but if you're going to err in some way, which way would you rather have? Uh, where people are, are wealthy, but some people aren't, or people have a more equal amount of income, but they have less freedom, less ability to make choices with that money because government has all these restrictions on their earning power and taxing them and things like that. Uh, I think you'd end up with a better world, a, a more healthy world, a cared for world in a world where people have the, the highest amount of disposable income to help others. Back to you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, I kind of want to follow this tangent one, uh, a little bit more, but let's let's kind of circle back to just one thing. Uh, let's talk about uh, like the homeless and you know veterans and, and stuff here in the United States that that yeah. you know need the help that, that you know they, they've earned the care that they were promised when they joined up to you know be in our armed services yeah and that that's an obligation our government needs to needs to honor and you know then you have government programs like the VA system that uh, how many how many veterans die every year because they can't get in to, to see their VA doctor to right. see their care you have to realize that the VA system is single payer system yeah that's what it is and it doesn't work you you find that in my, my my wife who works for Sanford Health, you know she has all kinds of true very very true facts and stories that that she's encountered with her work, that um, the the current Medicaid system is broken beyond all belief. The VA system obviously is broken beyond all belief. Uh, Medicare is <laughs> rapidly approaching insolvency. Yeah. You know, so you know how how do we fix these things? Well, we get, we diagnose the problem. That the problem is the government got in the got in the business of healthcare in the first place. Mm -hmm. So time to remove that tick. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, kind of a, just a small story that I want to share. And I'm, and I'm not doing this to like be braggadocious or anything sure. like that. But on Christmas Day, uh, I went by a, a local gas station and I uh, got some gas and went inside to pay and and uh, there was a couple there was a couple of homeless people there and one, one of whom actually lost lost a leg I don't know where he might have lost it but um, either way there was a couple of there were a couple of close buddies that appeared and uh, um, they were lining up to go to the counter to, and they were just counting every little bit of change that they had you know just for a, a stupid cup of coffee so you know yeah. char charity comes in all forms and this one came uh, for me as you know hey while I'm here, I'm paying for these guys' coffee. Yeah, it was a couple of dollars, but that was like that was a couple of dollars that those homeless people didn't need to spend. That that they could hang on to their money for a little bit longer, and 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 do what they wanted. And you know, like I said, not being braggadocious, but uh, I just I just feel that you know, charity comes from the heart. It comes from individuals, like you said, and it comes in all forms. You know, so. Um, I, if I can share, you know, if I can personally share some of my wealth, my, you know, with somebody else who, who needs it, then I, you know, I'd, I'd happily do it. So, it, like, it, charity come, doesn't come from government. It comes from us. It comes from people that want to give. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, uh, let's go, let's go f jump down this capitalism, <laughs> yeah. uh, this route. You know, as you can see, it's backwards, but. Uh, it might it might be in front words on enjoy capitalism enjoy capitalism and uh, capitalism has brought us the most prosperity the greatest wealth we, that this world, that this earth has ever seen um, yeah. from and I can kind of speak from more of a a rural stance that uh, capitalism has brought about the most some of the most efficient technologies. That we've ever seen um, it's brought us technology the likes that you know that you look at farming equipment nowadays where you have these massive tractors that can plant a, a, a soybean and a little bean of fertilizer right behind it at a specific depth underneath the ground and it does it for acres and acres and, and um, acres and you see you know bushel increases and uh, Productivity from farmers growing up, going. But this is probably the, the the best we've ever had it. We have GPS that can track exactly where your tractor is at. Um, 
Some of these tractors are even driverless. I mean, you have these kids that are that are piloting probably in total probably a, a million and a half dollars worth of equipment, and they're playing, they're thinking around in their Game Boy, as the tractor just drives itself down the row. The only thing the only thing the kid has to do is put his Game Boy down, flip the tractor around to go to go for, for to go for the next pass. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at that. I mean, compared to a hundred years ago when we were just subsisting off of threshing machines. Right. I think that the specific example, agriculture, what comes to mind for me, I, I really love history. I always have. And I think of the polar opposite of that. That is agriculture advancements through the private sector growing and it helps everyone make more food and, and feed more hungry people. The opposite response to that is, I think, of the Great Leap Forward, which was in China, communist China, in the 50s and 60s, where the government just said, okay, this is the law. We will produce this much food this year, and we will do it. But there was no private sector incentive to do it. There was nothing like that. And it led to the starvation of millions of people because they had this, this onus from the government to work hard and, and make all this food happen, but... It was such a controlled, constricted economy that there was no capital. There was nothing going around to to make that possible, and people ended up starving. And so um, I think that there's this false perception that if the government just dedicates itself to doing something, if we say we're going to end homelessness, then homelessness will be over. If we say that we're going to give health care to everyone, that everyone will have health care, um, but you can't just declare things and have them be so. You have to have the, um, the so, you have to have the naturally occur. You have to have the profit motive for it to happen. And to a lot of people today, especially people who are our age, sadly, um, profit is a bad word. And you think that if someone has to make a profit off something, then it's not being. Um, it's not being charitable, it's not being kind. If you want to make money, then that's bad. But uh, the thing that capitalism is good about, uh, like I said before, there is no utopian world. And socialistic ways of thinking, social democratic ways of thinking, want there to be this world where everyone thinks only of other people and we all, um, to, from each according to his ability, according to his need, you know, Marx's thing. But Capitalism realizes that we live in an imperfect world where people do have self-interest. You you think of yourself first, um, naturally. It's um, it's supernaturally that God enables us to think of others first and to think of God first to love our neighbor as ourselves. But naturally, people do think of themselves first. Capitalism takes that natural impulse to care for yourself and your own needs and turns it into something that helps other people too. Because profit is, if I do this for somebody, it doesn't just help them, it helps me. And so that person gets a hamburger, and I get some money, and everybody's happy. And, um, it, and it helps everyone. If you want to see fewer hungry people in the world, if you want to see more people in homes, free up the economy, stop the government mandates and dictates, and let people naturally, both through the supernatural love of God and caring for others and also through people wanting to to make make money. Making money is a good thing. Um, if you don't think that businesses or profits are a good thing, then you should throw away your iPhone, throw away your iPad, stop using Facebook, stop using Insta. Or <laughs> Insta. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, I just don't have any of that stuff. I, I don't get it. But, um, yeah, if... If people who are critical of profits and corporations and capitalism really hate capitalism, you need to probably stop wearing clothes. And um, in North Dakota, you would die if you stopped wearing clothes <laughs> because it was three degrees yesterday, I saw. Two below this two, morning. Two below this morning. And so, um, I, I, and this isn't to make fun of anyone. I'm just maybe kind of making fun a little bit there. But um, you, you really need to realize the world that we live in and take the things that maybe aren't good about the world um, and try to use them for as much good as possible. Um, 
in a world with capitalism, are there going to be people who use their wealth for themselves? Yeah. Are there going to be people who, who save all the money for themselves and don't give it away to other people? Yeah, there are going to be those people. What's going to happen to them? Well, God will deal with them. God is very clear that, that um, you know, do not store up riches for yourself on earth where rust and moth destroy, but save up riches for yourself in heaven that, that do things for God and, and love God and relate to God and be loved by God and your treasure is up there. But if you make your treasure on this place, in this world, uh, it will quickly be gone as soon as you are and you can't take any of your stuff with you. So uh, I also think a theistic worldview helps us to see justice in the world. If you think there's no God, then the rich just get richer and they have these great lives and poor people are sick, but we also have a God who cares for the poor and the, drown the downtrodden and the orphans and the widows. And um, so recognize that there are going to be people who make the wrong choices with their wealth and their money. But um, that means that it's up to us to make the right choices with our money. And we can choose to do that. And we don't have to have the government saying, you have to give this much money to the poor through taxes. It can be out of the goodness of our own hearts to do those things. Amen there. Yeah. So, yeah as, as you can see, there's a trending theme here where, you know, charity and giving and, and doing all these things doesn't come from government edict, it comes from us and we, we make the choice of of what we are what we're going to give. And it, it it shouldn't be up to bureaucrats from some distant capital somewhere. Yeah. Um here, here, here's something. I, I, I feel it. I feel in the mood to trigger some libertarian socialists by telling you, deluded people, that rent is not theft. Grow up, please. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding right. You're saying what? So libertarian socialists apparently have this misguided notion that uh, pay, paying rent is theft. Like you know all the whole taxation theft. No, whatever, blah, blah. no, nobody is making you pay rent. It's it's a voluntary contract that you entered into with your landlord. You want to use their property. Yeah. You got to pay for it. Yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the, the difference between taxation and rent is that taxation is an edict from the government. And I'm not a fully like taxation is theft libertarian. I think we do need to have a tax system, and we do need to have income. We need to reform from, that from, property from, though. From, yeah. And I'd even be okay with an income tax if it was flat, low rate. Um, I'm actually born on tax day, so I actually want <laughs> a, I want April fifteenth to be the happiest day of the year, because uh, it already is for me because I was born. Uh, <laughs> which how can we not be glad about that? But um, yeah, the the what was it? I heard somebody say once: if you really think taxation isn't theft, try not paying your taxes and see what happens. Like you will go to jail. People will come to your house. And take you away and put you in jail for not paying your taxes. Um, and you didn't sign up for that. Um, with rent, you're choosing to live in a specific place. And the rent, the apartment uh, landlord says, okay, if you're going to live here, this is how much you are going to pay. And um, if you choose to not do that, then they have every right to, to kick you out of the place because you signed a contract with them. Um, some people take, there's this theory called the social, social contract, um, that if you live in society, you pay taxes because that's part of the contract that we all signed as people and we all pay taxes so that we can all function and all these things. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice, uh, mistakenly said, taxes are the price we pay for civilization. Now, again, do I think we should have no taxes in there? No, you need to have, I would say, maybe a 10% flat tax on income, 10% flat tax on corporations. Um, close, close the loopholes, because yeah. like that's, that's the big thing that, that socialists are so worried about, is the rich aren't paying their fair share. Well, what's the best, most efficient way to make sure the rich pay their fair share? Close all... You, you track all that wealth to this country, and you make the, that, that taxation level low, like 10%, like you said, Matt, and... Close all the loopholes. That way they're paying their fair share. Yeah. Um, Everybody's paying the same. Shouldn't that be a good thing yeah. for you socialists? You want everybody to be the same. Yeah. I, Taxation I, I, rates I, the same. I, I think that if, <laughs> if you are a citizen of the United States, you must pay your taxes. 
you, you have to pay your taxes. Um, Bible, you know, says give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. Does that mean that you have a 50% tax and 50% of the, it is Caesar's? No, we can set what the tax rate is, but, um, but it's not wrong or unbiblical to have taxes. It's that are they fair? Are they equitable? And do they help people? At some point, tax rates get so high that it discourages investment, discourages entrepreneurship, and that actually hurts society. And um, well, you're punishing the wealthy for being wealthy. You know, yeah, that makes no sense. Yeah, and um, like Oliver Wendell Holmes said, Holmes, I'm in North Dakota. Uh, <laughs> like you said, taxes are the price prepared for civilization. Yeah, but we we can have civilization. We can have civilization with a low tax system. If if you look at countries with the highest um, human development index the and the highest life expectancy, two of the top places up there, uh, America, by the way, for life expectancy is like 15th or something. Um, the highest ones up there are Singapore and Switzerland are two of the top ones. Singapore, there is no minimum wage. There is no minimum wage in Singapore. Um, they can pay you a cent if they wanted to, but who would want to do that? Um, and unemployment in Singapore is like zero. Everybody has a job. There is no person without a job in Singapore because um, it's easier for employers to hire and fire people because they don't have to pay as much artificially set by the government. So, um, yeah, even in low-tax countries like Switzerland or Singapore, you can have flourishing civilizations with good schools and long life expectancy and good health care. And you can have these things without having 60% of your money go to the government every year. Um, you don't have to choose between those two things. That's what I'd say. Agreed there. So, um, I don't know. Let's, what do you think? Wrap this up? We can probably keep yeah, going too. Yeah. So. Uh, if there's any other topic that you would like to... Oh, also, just want to go back to Caring for veterans, like Brett said, I, I really do uh, care. Um, veterans do have a place in my heart. Uh, military service is a big thing in my family. My my cousin went to Iraq. My pastor, childhood pastor growing up, served in Iraq and in Kosovo. Uh, my grandpa was in uh, the military too. And my, my cousin, Cade, just got back from basic. Um, so I really do care for veterans. But the, the best way to help the veterans is to stop making more veterans. Stop having wars to send these young people to and stop making them veterans. Um, war is something that can be necessary, but it's to defend this country and to defend us from an eminent attack by, by a foreign power and defend the people of the United States. It doesn't mean you go all around the world searching for monsters to destroy, as John Adams said. That you're going to wear out if you do that. And um, it doesn't mean that we don't love their troops. Um, I, I love, if you go to defend this country and put your life on the line, you're a hero and, and God bless you. I just think our government policy is very stupid when it comes to war and they think it's heroic, heroic to be in more wars than you were the day before. And it's just not. Uh, so if you really wanna help the veterans, stop sending them places when they don't have to be. Here's here's a question before we kind of start wrapping things up. Here's, um, what do you think the the direction is that libertarian libertarianism is taking, um, and then also kind of that same vein. Which way do you think it should go? Well, uh, I'm concerned. Yeah, I'm concerned that some of the more there are some areas where I disagree with Ron Paul, especially on immigration. Ron Paul wants more closed borders and things like that. Um, I really want freer, higher levels of immigration. We need to change certain things about that. I, I think that part of why Donald Trump won uh, two years ago is that there were some members of the libertarian movement who who were attracted to Donald Trump and went over to him, kind of the more Pat Buchanan, maybe type of libertarians that are economically libertarian, but kind of not as much culturally or socially libertarian because there are these libertarians who really want to close the borders and things like that the the paleo libertarian 
uh, Pat Buchanan from the 90s. And um, I'm going to geek out a little bit here. Even up in Canada, let's see, there's this guy, uh, Maxime Bernier, who was gonna, who came really close to being the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada um, last time. Lost like this to, a, to an establishment guy. And his decision was to leave the Conservative Party and start his own party in Canada. But instead of being a libertarian party, which he was known to be, it's really turned into an anti-immigrant party. Um, which, I, you got to really be careful. Also, where is the immigration problem in Canada? I didn't know people were fleeing to Canada in mass. But um, I, I think that to be a libertarian, freedom has to be the answer. That freedom to make a profit, freedom to spend your money the way you want to, freedom to put what you want in your own body, whether it's, it's marijuana or lowering the drinking age, please. I, and this is coming from somebody who doesn't drink. I don't drink a drop of alcohol, but I think we need to let people drink at a more a younger age and grow in responsibility so we're not binge drinking when we're in college. But, um, yeah, libertarianism needs to be about freedom and only about freedom. And it needs to get out of the comment sections, get out of Reddit, <laughs> get out of, um, I'll say the oh, word, yeah. I'll, I'll say the word, uh, some, some neo-Nazi sympathizers uh, online. Um, you have these people who claim to be libertarians and all of a sudden they start talking about Jews. <laughs> like, what, what's wrong with you? Um, so back when libertarianism was, was growing, the liberty movement, um, I think a great example of a true libertarian is Justin Amash. Um, who is an immigrant himself from, from Syria, or the child of immigrants. Um, if you're going to have liberty, I'll circle back and firm this up, but if you're going to have libertarianism, it has to be based on more freedom for everyone. Not for your ethnic group, not for people who look like you, talk like you, think like you, uh, worship God the same way that you do. Um, it's about freedom for everyone, even to do things that make you uncomfortable even to make a society where you're kind of uncomfortable. Um, yeah, that's what... Libertarianism is about freedom. And if, it, if you in, introduce anything else into libertarianism, it becomes something toxic that I don't want to be part of, frankly. There's something very organic with that with the liberty movement that Ron Paul started uh, way back in 2008. Yeah. Roughly was when that was. And that, that was kind of my first awakening. And then just it really cemented came home for me in 2011 when I just started listening to Ron Paul and and uh, we just we, we just need to get back to that I think it's too bad that people are kind of treating Ron Paul like he's just some crazy old uncle now and he's and it's I don't know he's not <laughs> he's got yeah. more he's got more wisdom in his pinky than a lot of than a lot of people have a lot of, than a lot of socialists have brain cells so yeah. um, I, have a quick, but, uh, I have a quick story about Ron Paul <laughs> So I, when I went to Talbot School of Theology for my master's down in California, I started a chapter of Young Americans for Liberty, YAL, at Biola, the university it's part of. And I went a couple times to the YALCON National Convention. And people love Ron Paul. Like, almost kind of religiously, it's kind of weird. And um, <laughs> yeah. people were screaming, ah, Ron Paul, Ron Paul! And I remember saying to my friend Henry, I don't know if he'll ever see this, but... Um, I said, do you think that Dr. Paul was ever creeped out by his supporters? Yes. But w without a pause, <laughs> without a pause, Henry said, yes. So um, also to, in the liberty movement, to recognize that people are people and that uh, people aren't infallible. People do make wrong decisions, that it's about the principles um, that you hold to and not about following what one person says. Same thing, you know, I say with church, it's about the Bible and the Word of God, not about what your favorite pastor or preacher says or does. Um, say, any kind of principle that you hold to, it's about the core of that principle and not the personality. Exactly. But I do like Ron Paul. You know, kind of circling back to the question of in, at hand was, um, uh, you know, my concerns, my uh, what I, where, where I think libertarianism is going now versus the track I think it should take. Uh, where it's going now, it's not a not a good place. You have these socialists, you have these Marxists, um, and these postmodernists that have invaded this movement, and 
it's it's changed it to something where you know where we had legitimate grievances with with the United States government being wasteful and being uh, broken and just more doing more harm than good to now we're questioning the very existence of oh should we even have a government at all should we uh, do we need to uh, you know let's 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 just smash reality and, and insert our own yeah which is insanity in my opinion yeah um, the government's always there's always gonna be some kind of form of government somewhere so taking this this Marxist notion that that you want to have a stateless classless society um, looking at you you Marxist, Lipsock, insane people. He's, um, he's having a good day. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> take that notion and shove it because it's not going to work. Sorry. Um, here's the track that I think that libertarianism absolutely needs to take. And that is um, we need to go back to the original intent of the United States Constitution in this country. Absolutely we need to do that. We need to not compromise on anything. We need to... Um, we need to take a look at long and hard at some some amendments out there, uh, in our constitution that need to be changed. Uh, like direct election of senators, I think was a gross mistake, uh, in my opinion, because you know back in the day before we uh, how it used to work was you know you had the the House of representatives which the common man yeah. voted for those people they went to Washington D.C. and did their two years blah blah blah. Now you and then you had senators who their terms are every six years as everybody knows um but back then their state legislatures voted for who's going to be the, the two senators that go to washington and if the senators fail to do their job in washington dc the legislature their home state legislatures could recall them at any time and tell them you're not doing your job we're replacing you yeah. and and that, in the in the middle of the term they could do in the middle of the term they could do it absolutely and uh, yep, okay. it was it was a it was a recall that could happen at any time, and that was, that was always held over the senators' heads because if they if they if they quit doing the, the the jobs that their home state wanted them to do at D.C., they could be yanked home, and they got a special election.